Mr. Hey, uh, hey everybody, how y'all doing? The congratulations are in order. I hear that you were nominated for 482 Emmys. <laughs> Well, that may be a bit of a, an overstatement, but thirteen and that thirteen is great. That is uh, that is uh, it, it has been a very good day. You're catching me on a, a very good day here for sure. Excellent. I'm glad I'm catching you before you get drunk too, which is which is good because <laughs> I'm sure that'll happen. So there's a lot of Breaking yeah, Bad probably. fans out here, a hell of a lot. What surprises me as somebody who tries to dabble in writing is how much I read about how little you plan. So are you a deadline man or um, you just got too many avenues that you can't explore them until you're, you're right on the edge? It's, it's a little bit of everything. Uh, I definitely uh, do seem to need deadlines to, to make myself uh, produce. Uh, I remember back in the day before uh, television, uh, before I worked in television, I should say, uh, when I was trying to make my living as a, as a feature writer, basically no one was waiting that anxiously for, for my work and one time it took me I think two and a half years to write a first draft of a screenplay and I, I, I it was about five years there from about 1990 to about 1995 that I I wish I could go back in a time machine and, and kick myself in the butt really hard and because I feel like I wasted about a half a decade there but uh, once I got into television obviously television is, is all about deadlines and uh, I feel that uh, I need them they are a, a great motivator, uh, and um, so so yes, the deadlines are uh, helpful uh, to get me to produce. Uh, as is my wonderful writing staff. I have six excellent writers. We sort of try to know where we're going. We try to have some sort of big tentpole moments figured out uh, that we want to work toward. But I don't want to be too rigid in in my estimation of of what needs to to happen next if that makes sense, and, uh, and, and tell the story as organically as possible and not try to work too hard toward some foregone conclusion, as it were, but, but let the story find itself. So that, I guess, in my very long-winded way, is the answer as to why uh, we try not to know too much in advance where we're going. We try to let the characters tell us where they're going, as it were. So do you have dedicated writers looking after individual characters? No, we don't really specialize. My writers and I don't really specialize uh, on the show. We, we sit in a room with seven of us for many hours on end, and we ask ourselves the same basic questions over and over again. We say to ourselves, if we're talking about Walt, for instance, and, and he is who we talk about most of the time, we'll sit there and we'll say, okay, where is Walt at right now? Where is his head at? Uh, what is he afraid of right now? Who's out to get him, and what's his obstacle? And what does he want right at this second? What does Skyler want right this minute? What does Jesse want? And we will ask ourselves these, these basic building block questions over and over again. There's not one writer who specializes in, you know, Saul, for instance, or whatnot. We, we basically, all of us together, have this sort of a hive mind in the room, if you will. You know, when it's our turn individually to write an episode, they, they all tend to flow together pretty well. Everybody has a pretty good sense of the voices of the characters in the sense that it's hard to tell in hindsight who came up with what idea, who came up with what bit of dialogue uh, that we pitched out in the room or whatever. I tend to forget in hindsight who came up with what, uh, who said what, and it all flows together as one uninterrupted story uh, for the most part. If I'm correct, the premise that sold the execs way back when was uh, Mr. Chips become Scarface. Just how Scarface can we get before we completely despise Walt? And is that a, a dance that you torture yourself with, or is that relatively easy? No, that's a good question. And, and that is a dance that I did indeed torture myself with uh, for the first several seasons. I, I worried greatly. I lost sleep over the question of how bad is too bad and, and, and how can Walt remain sympathizable and likable? I worried in the early going, you know, if, if this character is not likable, who's going to want to watch him? And I suppose in the early going, before the audience that we have was, was hooked into the show, before we set the hook, uh, so to speak, it was more important that the character be likable in those early days. You had to understand as a viewer why Walter White was doing these making these very bad decisions that he was making. You have to have a bedrock of likability or sympathizability, relatability, when you, when you set off on this thing. But 
Uh, this, this show was always kind of an experiment. It was designed to be a show about transformation. And it was designed to be a show in which we took the good guy and had him, by force of will, transform himself into the bad guy. So if you embrace that mandate that we gave ourselves, you, you have to, if you embrace it with courage, you have to go forward with courage and say to yourself and say to the other writers, uh, okay, this guy's going to get worse with every episode. And the audience is not monolithic. Every audience member has his or her threshold for of disgust or, or morality or whatever as their threshold of how much they're going to buy into this guy's journey. And, and some people are going to, are more quickly going to say to themselves, oh, boy, this guy, I, I can't relate to him anymore. On the other hand, I, I came to realize that even if this guy, even if this main character becomes less likable, he, even the ones who say, you know, I'm, I don't sympathize anymore, nonetheless continue to say, I can't wait to see what this guy's going to do next. He's brilliant. Uh, he he's thinks he's very fast on his feet. He manages to he has this amazing instinct for survival, and he may, manages to get himself out of some very tight scrapes. And um, I'm just intrigued by what he'll do next. So that if he remains interesting, uh, we'll be in pretty good shape. His Heisenberg persona seems to come from the same rage that people have when uh, misspelt grammar assaults them. He seems to be fighting against incompetence and ignorance and sloth, you know? Or yeah. is, he, is he just the meth cook with no name? <laughs> I, I, he is a very, Walter White is a very interesting and very damaged individual. And I, I didn't realize this, I must say, in the early going. I've learned, it's been a real journey for the viewers to learn who Walter White is, but it's it's interesting that it's been just as much of a journey uh, for me to learn who he is. I mean, I I wrote this character way back when in that first episode. I you'd think I would have had a better idea of who this guy was right from the get go. But the wonderful thing about a television show is that it's a really a living, breathing thing, and you learn uh, more and more about the character that you are writing about. And I know now that what drives Walt. He's a very persnickety individual. Uh, he's got a real sense of the way things should be. He's certainly uh, the way things should be done in science. Uh, he's, he's certainly uh, one to crack the whip on, on Jesse, for instance. He's a man of great pride. He's a man of very damaged and low self-esteem. And because of that, I think this self-aggrandizement that he feels uh, in being a, a drug kingpin and, and being powerful and making lots of money. And I think the money itself he uses a, as a yardstick to measure himself, to measure his progress. Uh, but it's all about the power for him because up until the day he started doing this, he, he felt he had none. There's a strange uh, tension there. There's a strange duality, if I'm using the word right, in the sense of on the one hand, he very much wants to stay out of trouble. He doesn't want the police breaking down his door. He does not want to go to prison. But on the other hand, if you're Jesse James and the world doesn't know it, you know, uh, are you are you lacking uh, somehow? Is it, it as much as he doesn't want to go to prison? He, I think, he does want the world to to realize his prowess and his ability, and and that's uh, a tension that that increases, I think, as these episodes progress. I've got some questions from our, from our loyal followers at Popcorn Taxi. So one of the first ones is, when is Walt going to try his own product? Or is that the ultimate low or high for a protagonist such as this? That's a good question. Uh, when will Walt try his own product? I, You know something? You'd be surprised at how little uh, that subject has come up in the room. I suppose we have floated that idea uh, probably half a dozen times in five years. Who knows? We may indeed go down that path at some point or another. But Walt, it seems to us, to, to my writers and myself, uh, Walt is hooked on power and hooked on process. And the process of cooking meth is, uh, is an addiction to him. And the process of growth as a kingpin, of, of watching the money pile up in, in fat stacks, as, as Jesse might say, intrigues him and appeals to him and, and indeed addicts him. And to that end, he feels to me and to us like a man who would not risk any of those greater highs by becoming sloppy and becoming uh, less than precise. If he were on meth, 
he'd be awake longer to cook more, but the cooking itself would suffer, and I think uh, that would be anathema to him. He would never, he would never go for that. So, the few times we floated that idea, we uh, have, at least thus far, have, have quickly discarded it. Now there are a lot of amazing series being produced these days: uh, Mad Men, The Wire, Game of Thrones. You guys, are we experiencing a golden age for TV? And if so, why? Well, uh, I'd like to think we are, although I think there's been several golden ages of TV, but I'd love to think we're in the midst of another, and, and may it go on for, for many years, many decades. Uh, I'm certainly enjoying working in television right now. Uh, this is the greatest uh, creative uh, freedom I've ever had and the greatest pleasurable working situation I've ever had. I have written uh, a great many movies, uh, movie scripts. Most of them have not been made couple of them have. They have not been the most wonderful experience uh, because in the movie business, the writer is very much the low person on the totem pole. But in television, the writer is the boss. And man, I got to tell you, I love that. The business, there's a lot of really smart people trying to make movies in, in this country who want to make movies like they made in the 70s, in the 1970s, and all these wonderful smaller movies that were for grown-ups. And, and, and Nowadays, the business model is such that they make fewer movies here, but they make each one of those movies for more money. Uh, and because they're making fewer movies, uh, because they're rolling the dice fewer times, they have to hit. They have to make money on, on each of these rolls. So they try to bulletproof their, their movies by, oddly enough, by spending more on them and by knowing in advance what the poster is and knowing in advance they can sell them to uh, a certain uh, you know, quadrant of, of you know, 13 to 19 year old guys and, and you know that's great they should be making all those movies for 13 year old boys they should be making also movies for 68 year old women they should be making movies for 47 year old guy Every, everyone should get their movie I think it should be very democratized the movie business unfortunately it's just not anymore but uh, those stories have to be told somewhere, so now they're being told in television. And um, that's, as I say, great for me, although I'd love to see the movies uh, doing that again as well. But like any creation, when, when the public take ownership, that brand is now, it's now a religion. How difficult is it to keep satisfying your own curiosities and flexing your own muscle, being the boss, but making sure that the flock are happy? Well, it's it's uh, on a on a on a. Gosh, uh, excellent question. I the best way I can answer it is, I do my damnedest to not think too hard about that. I never go on the internet and Google myself. I never look up. I've never Googled the show. I've never gone on the computer and typed in Breaking Bad. Uh, it's not that I'm not interested. Far from it. I'm very interested in what people have to say. But I know that it is a rabbit hole that I would, I would very quickly disappear down. It would be a situation in which suddenly I was chasing after opinion, aggregating it together and trying to figure out, you know, what, are the, what are the folks like, what did they like this week, what did they not like? And, and then suddenly uh, you're not really doing your job anymore. I think my job as a writer and my six writers' jobs as, as my fellow writers on this show is that we are the seven original fans of this series and we have to please ourselves which sounds very egotistical or, or self-centered or whatever but it, it really I think it behooves us to do that and I think it helps the show for us to kind of keep the blinders on a little bit and please ourselves and say to ourselves you know would Walt really do this in this moment what, what is it I want to see him do next in my heart of hearts can we get there uh, and, and so that is, that is the way I do it. Every showrunner has his or her own way of doing things. Some people, the opposite of me, get on the computer, they're always Twittering, you know, talking to the fans. They're, uh, I, don't, I, don't do, I don't do any of that stuff or Facebook or any of that. I just, I'm just, it's just, I'm too old or something. That's just not me. I'm not going to sit here and say that, uh, that is not a good way to do it. It's just, I just know it's not a good way for me. I have to be the first fan and please myself. I know that obviously the the most paramount thing in your mind is to is to come to the conclusion of this this saga, this tale, this story. But beyond that, are there projects that you've 
you, you've not spoken about that really you'd like to do that might not be what people think? I, uh, I am such a terrible multitasker. I have not really thought about much else, m many other projects um, since this started. I've been doing this now for six or seven years, you know, including a year or two before it ever went on the air. Uh, I wish I were a better multitasker. I am just now starting to have this tickle in the back of my head that, man, I better think of something because <laughs> you know, I better strike while the iron is hot. This show has been wonderful on a great many levels for me, and it will allow me uh, a, a window of time, hopefully not too short a window of time, but it will allow me, once it is over, a window in which uh, people will take my calls all over Hollywood, uh, at least for a little while, and, and offer me a great many things. So I want to make the right choice uh, when I choose uh, what it is that I do next, whether that is now, a minute ago, I was ranting about movies, but uh, I haven't said that. I'd love to direct a movie before I'm done. Uh, it's just, it's, it is what I got into the business to do, write and direct movies. Uh, I, I can't imagine I want to do it so bad, though, that I'd want to do, you know, some, you know, fourth or fifth sequel of some comic book franchise. I, I think I'd want it to be, come hell or high water, some, as I say, some movie for grown-ups in some sense. You know, I don't really have any passion project that I've got some old scripts that I, I'm proud of, very proud of, but I, I read them now and I, you know, I've got a couple of them that are over 20 years old that I thought for years I, I would want to make and now I read them and it's like a different person wrote them. I don't even remember writing them and I think to myself, you know, better find something new, you know, just blowing the dust off some old thing is maybe not the way to go. Uh, Sony, who I work for, screened uh, back around the holidays uh, at the end of last year, screened The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo for me. And uh, I liked that very much. I thought that was well done. Uh, very much not for kids, that movie. Had not seen the original. Didn't know anything. I just knew it was a phenomenon going into it. But David Fincher is a brilliant director. Anything that he comes out with is, is something I want to go see. The Social Network before that I saw, enjoyed very much. I want to see uh, Bruce Beresford's new movie. I have not. I know that he's got a new one out. One of my favorite movies of all time is, uh, speaking of wonderful Australian movies, is uh, Breaker Moran. One of my favorites. What a what a great back-to-back uh, -back, uh, double feature that would be. Um, Paths of Glory and then Breaker Moran back-to-back. -back. Uh, Peter Weir as well, wonderful director. Ma Master and Commander, that was a damn good movie. That movie should have done better. I, I don't know why it didn't. That was a wonderful movie, wonderfully made, I thought. Cool. Well, look, I'm going to let you go and um, start hitting the bar as you deserve tonight. Thank you again for your time and congratulations and um, good luck putting pen to paper for the next part. Thank you so much, Chris. It tickles me to no end to hear that uh, that folks down there uh, want to see the show. And I can't even believe the show's on the air in the first place, but the fact that people all around the world uh, want to watch it just uh, tickles me to no end.